and I've been with you many, many times before. As I said, we, we have a retreat center up in the west slopes of the beautiful Chiricahua Mountains. It's a good ways from here. And I was sure I was going to make it on time. I got in here about five or ten minutes ago and we made it. But would somebody help me? Because I have a handout. Let's see. I'm pretty good at handing stuff out. Can you That's hand it up? It. Let's see if I can find the right one for you to hand out. I did well ago to do this place up. I think that's good. Maybe we don't have any. Maybe I don't have to hand it on this. Yes, there, 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 those are the ones I want you to hand out right there. You forgot to put them on that. Everybody want, I think we've got enough to go around. It's kind of an outline of what we're going to be doing in our Bible study this morning. I didn't know this before, but I thought it might help if you had something to look at so you could follow me and keep you awake, too. <laughs> Driving here this morning, I had a long way to think I like to drive my regular truck. It uh, keeps me praying that uh, you know, I can make it here. But uh, when I drive, I, I listen to this gospel music. Lord, do you do that? Sure you want to know. And I was uh, thinking about a song uh, by Vesco Goodman. Do you know that name? Vesco Goodman? And she had a song. It might have been her theme song. I don't know if she's still alive or not, but she was sitting in a lot of love. I wouldn't take nothing from a journey now. I got to get to heaven somehow. Remember that song? And th those were afraid that that song was going through my mind. In fact, I was listening. These things are sticking together. I'm so grateful. Like money. That's got money to them. All right, thank you. And didn't good. let me do things my way. Right. You know, I, I oh, that's what, what you're, you're doing. doing. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with being a cowboy. I'll be 80 years old. I know I just look 55, but I still look 80 years old. I'm an expert, you know. And, uh, and I say with this, uh, man, I wouldn't take nothing from my you know, I think I started to when I was about 22 years old, 21, 22 years old. And just to think, I could have spent the rest of my life, all of my life, up to this point. Everybody's got them. <laughs> Next time. I don't want to be a waste or not. Like I said, There's two I love cowboys and cattle. I can't read, but I can see the difference in the screen. I'm sure I'm glad to be here. There's a young lady sitting clear in the back. She got in here just behind me. She came from Tucson. That's a short trip. That's uh, Sinjur Yin. Can you say that? She's Chinese. Does she, she doesn't look Chinese, but she is. Good morning. Grew up born in Shandong province in a little city called Bingyo. Been there many, many times with she and her husband. And uh, she's on the board of our ministry. Our ministry is called Blessed Hope Ministries. It's a 501c3. And we operate the camp, Rock Creek Ranch Retreat, out there in the Chiricahuas. But Cindy is kind of a... Uh, missionary for our organization. She does PowerPoints for our television work or while we're preaching in different places if they have the PowerPoint program. I preach nearly every Sunday somewhere or I'm teaching somewhere. And she does a lot of that, putting that together. In fact, she has, I just brought this to show you. This is a, a manuscript, a book that we've recently put together. We haven't got, uh, this is the, what you call the proof copy. To check my spelling, which is, needs, check, believe me. But uh, we're going to be printing this up. This is uh, 50 sermons, outlines and sermons about Christmas. 50 different outlines and sermons. I, do y'all like Christmas? Amen. I really do. I like the lights. I like the music. I like the decoration. I like the gift giving. I like everything about Christmas. Most of all, I, want, I like what Christmas is all about. Amen. And the message of the incarnation that God became man, took upon himself flesh. Paul said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God would become a man. I don't need to keep one of these myself. 
you need to be looking at uh, pages number one up there. Because this is going to be where we're headed uh, in these three times together this morning, twice, and tonight again. Uh, there's a song called, Do You See What I See? Christmas song. No. Do you see what I see? The song, the song, dancing in the sky. In fact, the music of Christmas just blesses my heart. I can sing Christmas carols all year long. Amen. So I, my, my favorite, I don't know what your favorite is, but I think my favorite, I'm not sure I've got it. I like them all. I don't know what to tell them that that's, that's one of my favorites, I have to say. But there's so many wonderful, wonderful songs. Uh, there's a song that's not considered a Christmas song, but I think it ought to be, and it's based on the music of a great, great uh, uh, classical uh, Oso Romeo. Uh, and the, the, that, that song has been put to many different lyrics. Even Elvis Presley put it to a, to a lyrics. If thou boy never come home, well, I'm not going to sing that for you. <laughs> but uh, the classic Christian words to that song. Down from his glory, ever living story. Uh, and it's just a great, great message of song. Uh, he came to a manger to his own stranger, a man of sorrow, tears and agony. What a great Christmas song. It's not recognized as a Christmas song, but pretty. So, uh, Cindy, we're glad you made it. Her name, English name, is Cindy. Her Chinese name is Sinjur Yin. Do you remember that? Remember that? There's going to be a test at the end. Of it. <laughs> uh, we use some of these videos on YouTube, and uh, we can't go to China anymore. That's close for us, but we can still talk to our friends there, some of them through WeChat, and uh, if they can get YouTube and some of these other things, they can get some of the Bible teachings that we do. Do you see what I see? And we're going to talk about the shepherds and the wise men in different order. We're going to talk about the star and the wise men here in just a moment. And it's, none of this is new to you. I know that. But maybe I can bring out some secret gems in the Christmas story that you haven't thought of. Whether we're talking about the wise men, or the star, or the shepherds, or the angel. And tonight, one of my favorite Bible studies on Christmas is answering the question, why did God choose Mary? And the Bible tells us why he chose Mary. You know, Scripture says in the Old Testament, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro, finding somebody somewhere that he can use for his purpose and for his glory. God's looking for people that he can use. So we're going to find out tonight from Scripture, why did God choose Mary? You think it was just arbitrary? You think God just, that? Eh, take that young lady, we'll use her. No, you're going to find out some real, and the point is, tonight's message is really more about New Year's, which we're just eight days into, aren't we? Is this the eighth? Yeah, it's more about New Year's, and if God is going to use you, does that melt your butter? Does that crack your chapter, tractor? Does that accept you a little bit? Do you want God to use you in 2023? I mean, 375 days from now, whatever it is we've got left in this year, do you want to come to the end of this year and say, it was a good year? Amen. God used me. That's what will make it a good year. So you come back and be with us tonight. And we're going to talk about why did God choose Mary? Now, the reason I put this little book together uh, is for pastors. And we have these are just the proof of it, and, and we're going to be public, uh, putting the rest of it together in the next week or two and making more copies of it. This one has both English and Chinese version uh, of everything. It's twice a little thicker than the other one. But we're going to have them in English and Spanish, English alone, and English in Chinese, but they're basically for pastors. Over the years, and I've been pastoring for 60 years, and when you pastor one church, as long as I did, First Southern Baptist Church, 33 years, uh, you can't rely on the same sermons every year at Christmas time. We had ladies in our church who were uh, sermon 
detectives. Or, uh, <laughs> they would write in their Bible the date when I preached that sermon. And when we were leaving church, if I was preaching the same sermon, they would scold me for it. Where well, I heard that one, Pastor? And I, you know, that's why lots of pastors only hang around their church three, four years. Did you know that? I'm talking about Baptists now. Most Baptist pastors, the, 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 the length of time they serve a church, on average across America, is three or four years, then they go to another church. And that way they don't have to prepare new sermons all the time. <laughs> they can preach the sermons they already had prepared. They take with them to another church, preach the same Christmas sermon. So, but seriously, I've had pastors come to me and say, your pastor, my goodness, how long has Rick been pastor? Uh, 28 years. 28 years. See, he can't get by preaching the same service. <laughs> yeah, this is why I say, I have it in my Bible. You preached that just four years ago. Come <laughs> on, something new. This is more study, pastor. So um, I, the pastors would say to me, Do you have any sermons on? Easter, you know, I feel like I've extinguished everything that I've had to say about Easter, everything I've had to say about stewardship, or everything I've had to say about the second coming of Jesus. And by the way, that's going to be the next list of sermons. I've got many, many sermons on Christmas Phase 2. I think maybe I'll title the book, Christmas Phase 2, When He Comes the Second Time. Are you excited about that? You know, we talk about music. Some wonderful music has been written about Christmas. But the best music, brother, is yet to come. When we're, we're going to have musicians in heaven composing songs about the second coming, amen? Like, we have some good songs about the second coming. The king is coming, the king is coming. That's a great song. But all the songs that have been written about his first coming, after he came, and the songs that are going to be written about his second coming, and we're going to be singing those songs in heaven. Now that's something to get excited about. Amen. So I'm going to put together another book with sermons about, I have more sermons on the second coming than I do on the first coming. More, more sermons, I think, in my uh, notebooks, sermon notebooks at home, about his coronation than his incarnation. Or even his Crucifixion. I said, well, how many songs do we have on the cross? <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to put the next book together on the second coming. Christmas, phase two. The Bible says we should be looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Paul says, I give the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not for me only, but for all those who love his appearing. Amen. You fit into that category? Amen. Thy kingdom come, the last prayer in the Bible, kingdom's home, Lord, come quickly. Right? The last promise in the Bible, behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. <laughs> so, we, we should be excited. Somebody said the greatest threat to Christianity is an unexcited Christian. Amen. Are you excited? Yes. I see glee busting out all over your faces. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you are. I love this church and I'm so grateful that once in a while Rick lets me come and, and to preach and teach. Which is what we're be doing right now. <laughs> Do you see what I see? We're going to talk about the shepherd, what they saw. That's in the 11 o'clock service. The shepherds saw glory in the sky. Right now we're going to get to it. The wise men saw guidance in the star. And tonight we're going to talk about Mary and Joseph saw God in the sun. In the fullness of time, Paul says, Galatians 4, God sent for his son. You see, Jesus was a son long before he was a baby, right? <laughs> uh, there's an Old Testament verse in Isaiah that says, uh, for unto us a child is born. That's, that's his incarnation. That's the flesh and the birth of Jesus. But it also says in that verse, unto us a son is given. He already existed before Christmas, right? I'm not telling you that you already know. 
what you can do, get excited about that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, what time, by the way, am I supposed to wrap this up? Quarter two? Yeah. Turn that over to page two, and we're going to kind of focus in on what the wise man discovered. Again, these are probably not truths you haven't already discovered, but if you haven't discovered these truths, you need to discover these truths. And uh, the Bible is a wonderful book, an amazing book. Not the book of the month, not the book of the year, it's the book of eternity. Amen. Scripture says then, the 119th Psalm, Thy word, O Lord, is settled in the heavens. Thy word is pure, he says. But some of the truths, I don't know if you've discovered this, but some of the truths in the Bible aren't laying on the surface. You've got to dig for them, right? And these discoveries I'm going to share with you are not deserves, but they're there. And that, you know, you, 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 you got, the Bible says, Psalms 18, uh, is it Psalms 19? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's the, the Psalm on the Bible. It says, uh, Thy word is more to be desired than gold and much fine. You got to dig for gold. It's not always just laying there on the surface. Amen. This is why the Bible says, "Study to show thyself so proved unto God." A what? A workman. A workman. Some of the greatest truths in the Bible. You got to work at to find them. You got to dig into God's word, and we're going to look for some of those nuggets in our our messages this this weekend. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes as we study your word that we might uh, see the truth. Silently now we wait for thee. Speak to us through your spirit. Guide us as we open scriptures. And as we reflect back on a couple of weeks ago when the Christmas season was here, nobody knows exactly what day, what time of year, what season Jesus came into the shepherds. When Gabriel made that announcement nine months earlier to Mary and to Joseph, you know, we don't know the exact day, but every day the message of Christmas is relevant that God became a man. So speak to us about that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's read this. And uh, we'll never get through if I ramble to you. Know, talk about so many different things that are relevant to what we want to share. I'm looking at Matthew's Gospel. Uh, verse 2. Chapter 2, excuse me. Again, if you're familiar with it. Let me read it, then we'll make some comments about it. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, magis, astronomers, from the east came to Jerusalem. And they said to Herod the king, Where is he that is to be born, king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. You know enough about Herod to know that he was a, a good word, jerk. <laughs> Sent the soldiers down to kill all the babies two years and younger, a little bit later on in the story. When Herod had a cold, everybody in Jerusalem sneezed. I mean, that was the influence he had on the people of Israel and on Jerusalem. And now he's troubled, and everyone else is troubled. Why is he troubled? 
Well, there could only be one king to choose, and he had the crown. And, and, and this was a threat. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, the scribes, and the people together, he inquired of them, saying, Where is the Christ? who was to be born. Interesting question right there. Where is the Christ who was? Do you know how many prophecies there was in the Old Testament about the first coming of Jesus? Messianic prophecies we call them. The Psalms was full of Messianic prophecies. Uh, we've already quoted two of them from Isaiah. I think it's in Proverbs 30. Four, might be in that area somewhere, talks about God, Jehovah. And then a question is asked to the reader of Proverbs there. What is his name? He has a lot of names. Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai, Jehovah. But then ask the question, what is his son's name? <laughs> what is his son's name? That must have shook a lot of people up back then. What did he know him so? What is his son's name? Tell me if you can. But we know. The angel said, his name shall be called Emmanuel. And it goes on to say, where is this Christ who was to be born? Verse 5. And so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this thus is written by the prophet Micah. Uh, and Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you found him, come bring me word that I might come and worship him too. And when they, they heard the king, they departed. And the old star which the, they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child of Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Another way. Now here's some principles that I wrote down. This is what the West may discover. This is what you may discover. These are four relevant truths about our world today. What have they discovered? They discovered the scripture was reliable. Right? Herod says, what's the Bible say? Micah chapter 5, isn't it? That he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And as I mentioned, that's just one prophecy about the Christmas phase one. There are hundreds of them. There really are hundreds of them. Where he would be born. Daniel tells us when he would be born. Another prophet in the Old Testament says why he would be born. And what his name would be 3,000 years before he was born. <laughs> How would you like to get an uh, uh, invitation to the birth of a child from a friend? And they said, oh, he's going to be born 300 years from now. Just take a number out of the sky. And we want to invite you to come to his birth. We're going to have a shower, bring a gift. <laughs> 300 years from now, and, 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 his name is going, and they already have a name for it. They already knew it was going to be a boy. Didn't know, you know, normally we have to wait till the morning to decide what kind of name we're going to give him, right? Well, that's up in the air today. Yeah. <laughs> if you know anything about the woke crowd. <laughs> yeah, we don't decide their birth until they decide whether they want to be a boy or girl. Don't go there, Pastor. Don't go there, Pastor. Okay. What the wise men discovered? They discovered the scripture was reliable. Have you made that discovery? Have you? I don't know all of you here. You might be new. You might be thinking about becoming a Christian. I don't know. Maybe all of you have made that discovery. But uh, thy word, the Bible says, is a lamp unto me with my feet, a light unto my path. Thy word, wherewithal shall I have my cleanses with by taking heed unto thy word. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's the one thing in life you can be depend on. Scriptures are reliable, and the wise men discovered that. Amen. Born in Bethlehem, let's go. There he is. They also discovered that sin was rampant. Somebody said there's three spirits of Christmas. It hasn't changed much. 
Breathe, spirit. Have you ever caught the Christmas spirit? Did you catch the Christmas spirit eight days ago? I don't know if it been more than that one day. It would have been 25th. Well, anyway. Sometimes you go through, even Christians go through the whole year and say, you know, I just didn't get the Christmas spirit this year. Well, if you catch the Christmas spirit, and really, I mean catch it, it will last all year long. Really well. The message of Christmas and the Christmas spirit. But there's three Christmas spirits. There is the, in the text we've just read, there is the spirit of uh, animosity or anger. That, that's in here. They brought that out, right? Do you want to, do you want to kill a boy? Uh, that's one of the Christmas spirits. There's a lot of people today that just can't stand to go shopping. Now, I don't like to shop. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I heard about one lady. She drug her kids around in the mall, and she was worn out, and her feet hurt, and she had a headache, and she got in an elevator to get down to the parking garage, and the other people were in the elevator, and she was wore out, and these three kids in packages, and she said, I don't know who dreamed this thing up of Christmas, but they... They ought, to, they ought to hang him. Well, there was somebody on the elevator who said, ma'am, that's exactly what they did. <laughs> but a lot of people have that spirit of Christmas, animosity. Others have the spirit of apathy. I don't care. Doesn't it amaze you that the wise people in Jerusalem, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, said, well, this is what the Bible says. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay, said the wise men, let's go to Bethlehem. And they went by themselves. Nobody else wanted to go with them. Indifference. I mean, we get wrapped up in gifts and reindeers and Christmas trees and secular music and all this stuff, and we miss the Christmas spirit. But the real wise men in our story, and we don't know whether it was three or a hundred. Did you know that? It just says they had three gifts. That's why we assume they're three. Belthazar, and I forget the names of the other two. <laughs> it might have been more than three. But the wise men, and when they came to the house where the young child was, they went in and did what? Worship. Worship. That's the spirit of adoration. And if you can catch that Christmas spirit, it will be with you all year long. Oh, come let us adore him. That's right. Don't lose the Christmas spirit. So the scripture was reliable. They found that out. As you can find out, you can trust God's word. It's not a book of wonders. It's a book of wonders. And I've been studying it thoroughly for 60 years now, pastor for 60 years. As I said earlier this morning, it's not the book of the day, the book of the month, the book of the week, the book of the year. It's the book of eternity. It's the book of life. You can trust it. God has promised. It is a book of inspiration. It is a book of preservation. It is a book of... Decoration should be And they discovered the Savior was he was real. Was real. You know, it would have been so easy for them to follow the star, and when they got there, is the boy home? Yeah, he's in no longer in danger now, you realize. Now he's in the house. Came to the house where the young child was. Is he home? Yeah, he's here. Well, our trip was a success. We found out where it was. God bless you. We'll leave our gold out here in our frankincense and we're going back home. Get the camels ready, fellas. <laughs> you know, a lot of people come that close to discovering that Jesus is real and instead of reality, they have religion in their mm -hmm. relationship. Beware of religion. Amen. Jesus was killed by a religious group, right? And he came to save us from two things, our sin and for, from religion. And sometimes the latter is harder than the first. He went to the cross to save us from our sins, but he wants us to be personal. He wants us to have a personal relationship. We'll talk about that more at 11, at 11 o'clock. See, these are just great, great principles. The scripture was reliable. The sin was rampant. The Savior was real. I'll sing it, I'll shout it wherever I go. I want all to hear it. I want all to know the joy of salvation that makes my heart glow since I've been born again. Is Jesus real to you in your life? 
You know, Baptists, if they're not careful, can just have a form of godliness. They can just be religious and not have a relationship Very with nice. Jesus. Oh, there's one last thing on here, isn't there? The scripture was reliable. Sin was rampant. The Savior was real. And the search was rewarded. <laughs> this reminds me of one of the greatest, greatest promises in the Bible. How many of you have <clears throat> some special promises you like in the Word of God? Yeah. You could probably quote, throw some of them out to me. You know, I mean, wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's a promise in the Scripture, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But there's lots of promises. Here's a great promise. I've been holding on now that I'm getting to be an old man. I'm really holding on to this promise. In hope of, this is in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, whom the God who cannot lie has promised from before the foundations of the world. Now that's one you need to take to Heaven's Bank and cash it in. Put it up on a wall. Some of you are almost as old as Pastor Hart. I can tell. The closer we get to Heaven, that's a good one to hang on to. In hope of eternal life. From the God who cannot lie. Has promised. From before the foundations of the God always planned for you to live forever. He's promised it. Eternal life. Eternity's too long to be wrong. Amen. <clears throat> right? Well, they discovered the search was rewarding. And the Bible says, God can be trusted. We're not going to, an angel told them, don't go back to Jerusalem. And the scripture says, and they went home a different way. Now that could mean geographically, it took another trail back to where they came from. We don't really know where they came from. Persia, maybe. No, there's some confidence that they might have been Chinese. I've talked to Cindy about this. The Han Dynasty was ruling China at the time of Jesus' birth. The emperor at that particular time was the last name Shao, a very common name. And the emperors of China had astronomers, 14 every night, 7 more every day, in the Forbidden City, watching the heavens. Because they, they, they had reasons for studying the stars. They believed that strange things could happen in the heavens that affected people here on Earth. And there was a star at exactly this time. It's recorded in the annals of astronomy in China. You can read about it today. You'd have to get a native translation, but you can read about it today. And, 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 and according to that, it was actually a comet, but it was, a, it was called a bi-comet. That's what they called it in China because it had no tail. It was just a star that kept moving. And they watched it for almost 100 days moving to the west. At the same time, this happened. So maybe the wise guys were Chinese. That throw your theology all over. Well, God is no respecter of persons. Amen. 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 I can spend a lot more time talking to you about China and their religion and how close it is to the Old Testament and uh, Shandi, the God that they worship. But the search was rewarding. Here's one of my favorite promises. Uh, Hebrews chapter eleven, verse four. Nothing pleases God like faith. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And throughout scripture, I think it's Isaiah 55, verse 5. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Amen. Call upon him when he is near. This is a, one of the great promises in the Bible. If with all your heart you truly seek me, what's the promise? You shall ever surely find me. That is a promise. If you really want to find God, if you really want to find Him, well, how many?
stars, let me ask you if you're saved here this, this morning. How many stars did God use to lead you to Jesus? I'm not talking about in the heavens now. God used somebody who shone the life of Jesus and drew you to Christ. Might have been your daddy, might have been your grandmother, grandpa, might have been a friend in school, or your co at work, I don't know. Because when you're omnipotent, you've got stars everywhere. Did you know that? Now, I think it says over in the book of Hebrews. I think it's in Hebrews. No. No. It's in Psalms. Psalms, Psalms, Psalms. 47, 48, somewhere in that area. God has numbered all of the stars in the universe. Now, what kind of a number could that be? Astronomers today say they are in just in our galaxy. But the psalmist says, God has numbered all of the stars, and he calls them all by name. Woo. Now, God has other kind of stars. L let me read this verse to you. I get it. This is, this is found in Daniel chapter 12. Listen to this. Those who are wise, you don't be a wise man, wise woman, but those who are wise, I think the scripture says elsewhere, he that is wise leads so that he speak with Christ, right? He, he, wisdom is being a soul with. But this verse says, those who are wise, verse 3, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament shall shine, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever You want to be a star? I'm not talking about a movie star. I'm saying you want to be a star. You want to shine for Jesus. Jesus is called the bright morning star. Amen. You know, there used to be a movie called A Star is Born, and it was talking about Hollywood. Well, every time somebody is born again and received Jesus in their heart, a star is born. Amen. And God wants to use you to glow and shine and be a witness for Jesus. And he that is a soul winner is wise and you will shine like the stars in the heavens. I've often thought, what stars did God use in my heart's life to draw me to Jesus? I could name some of them. Or I've often thought, who's been drawn, drawn to Jesus because of Ron Hart? Has he shown as much as he should have? You can be a star. You can be a star to somebody in their life. What star did God use to draw you to Jesus? Who do you know that's not a Christian in your life right now and you can shine for the Lord and be a witness for him and help them get to Christ like that star that those wise men passed? Wow. So some hidden principles here with the wise guys. Our wise men. What the wise men discovered. Scripture was reliable. Sin was rampant. You reckon that's true today? Oh, man. I hate to even turn the TV on anymore. Kids, kids, young people shooting each other in our bigger cities. Going into all kinds of stores, just robbing them, indifferent, never getting caught, looting everything they want to loot. Sin is rampant today in America. No. Somebody said they'll never have a nativity scene in Washington, D.C. Because there are no wise men there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, American, I love America. We're far past the slippery slope, folks. We're over the cliff. Amen. And, uh, but there's an answer. Amen. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Well, the search is rewarding. Bertrand Russell was an atheist, born in 1872, died in 1970. Bertrand Russell, remember that name at all? Yes. He was a mathematician. <coughs> And Bertrand Russell said, when I die, I'm going to tell God a thing or two if there is a God up there. 
I'm going to say, God, you didn't provide enough evidence to prove you existed. <laughs> well, there was another mathematician two to three hundred years before Bertrand Russell, and his name was Blaine Pascal. Godly Christian man. He was a mathematician. And he made this quote in one of his books. There is more than enough evidence to prove the existence of a creator and God to anybody who wants to find it. Amen. Amen. You see, the trouble with Bertrand Russell, he won't find God. When the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God, let's let say the fool in his head, in his heart. Not a mental problem, it's a moral problem. A lot of people can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a policeman. They don't want to find God. But Pascal said, if you want to find God, and that goes along with scripture, doesn't it? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And if with all your heart you truly seek me, you will find me. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek it. That's a promise you can. No. Well, this is this is supposed to be teaching, okay? I, I know. I have a hard time separating preaching and teaching. But I've tried to be calm. Eleven o'clock, I'm gonna get a lot more excited. <laughs> what what do you know that I didn't mention? There's other things that you've discovered, but uh, you know they said we have seen His star. Did you did you catch that? Mm -hmm. God has them all named out there. Astronomers are trying to put a tag on every star in the heavens and give it a name, but the best name is is His star, <clears throat> and God wants you to be called His star. Now I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. Not for a moment in time alone, but for all eternity. God says, when you were born again, a star was born, and God wants you to shine. Amen. Want to add anything? Got any question? Did I confuse you? Sometimes I do. Let me hear. Yes, sir, in the back. If you look to the western sky, that right after the sun sets right now, you can see that Bethlehem star. Is that it's, right? It's in the horizon every evening. Evening. <clears throat> just in right the after the sun set at the west, just above the horizon. Oh, and if you watch it, it'll set I'm, just like the sun does. Watch that. You know, the Bible says in Genesis that God puts stars in the heavens for seasons and for signs. There's a lot of Christian books written on the gospel and the stars. Amen. The old Hebrew... You know, in a, in a little while we're going to be talking about the shepherds. <clears throat> but the shepherds were stargazers too, just like the wise men. Amen. What did they do at night? Yeah. They didn't have a smartphone. <laughs> they didn't have a computer. They didn't have a laptop. They were out there by a campfire watching the sheep, looking at the heavens. So was Abraham, looking at the heavens. In the old uh, zodiac that belonged to the Hebrew people, they knew the galaxies and the constellations and the decons, which were the assistant constellations up there around each constellation. And they had a lot of the names to those stars that were up there. And they started, by the way, with Virgo, the Virgin, and all the way around in their constellation to Leo, or no, the Southern Cross, the cross. Told the whole story of the gospel in the heavens before Moses ever wrote the first book in the Pentateuch. They, they, they had the gospel and the stars. So God has never left this world without a witness. You understand? <clears throat> if you really want to find him, you can find him. But thank you for telling me that. <clears throat> That's called the... It's called the Bethlehem Star. <clears throat> Bethlehem Star. It's the first time in 500 years it's been... Really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. How long, much longer will it be shown? I don't know. Like you said, it was up for 100 days. Is and that you see it saying? in the western horizon. The western horizon. Just <clears throat> at dusk. Yep, just right after dusk. dusk. Yep. Well, Jesus is called the bright morning star. And the way my eyes are pretty bad, but as I look at it, it looks like there's a cross in that star. Well, there it's is split. a constellation that a lot of times doesn't reach our hemisphere. You hear yeah. in Africa, you can see it's called the Southern Cross. Yeah. That's right. Why would they call it a cross in the ancient uh, 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 Zodiac? What? And Virgo and, and Leo and all oh, it's Amen. It's amazing what God has given us. Amen. The point is this, though. You can stare at the stars, but God wants you to shine, okay? <laughs> they shall shine as the stars in the heaven. So glow for God. Shine for Jesus.
Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for this time to be together. And thank you for your word and help us to be wise. And thank you for all the stars you brought into our life that led us to Jesus. I'm thinking of a, when I was just a boy, my teacher at church in Las Cruces, New Mexico, in Sunday school class, came up to me and said, Ron, have you ever asked Jesus if you are? I said, I don't know how to do that. And he told me how. Thank you for that star and many other stars you brought into my life that I couldn't have shown for you today if it hadn't been for them. So help us all to shine in whatever area we're in, with whatever our contacts, circle of contacts is. Help us to shine for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, oh, you may be seated. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, they, they kind of wrangled me into this job. I don't usually do this, or so I make some mistakes. Give me a little grace, maybe a little mercy, too. But we just want to welcome you here this morning, and the best way I know how. And if you're here for the first time, we've got some uh, some paperwork for you. It's not an IRS form or anything like that, but it's a welcome. It tells you a little bit about the church. Here, come on forward, man. And it'll tell you why we use the King James Bible and what we believe about salvation and our Lord Jesus Christ. So... We just want to welcome you this morning, and you know what? You might be blessed enough to get a pen that works. <laughs> just come with a pen. So I want to make sure that all this family back here get a nice pen so they can write. Yeah. So raise your hands real fast, and uh, we'll get these to you. All right. Well, it's good to be here this morning with you. Good to have Pastor Ron back. And, really blessed by his message this morning. If you missed it, you missed out. Well, as you know, most of the church has gone on a uh, cruise. We hope they're all doing okay. Uh, we say, no, we do. We hope they're having a good time and getting some rest and relaxation so they can come back and help charge our batteries back up with the good time they've had. But in this week coming up, we've got some things going on you probably need to know about. Um, so tonight we want you to come back and hear Brother Ron Hart as he brings forth God's Word. We have a, is that Tuesday night Bible study going yes. on? So yeah. there'll still be the Tuesday night Bible study here at the uh, at the back of the church here. And we're also, uh, yeah, if you come back Wednesday you'll be able to hear me. And I'm going to bring a, a study out of God's Word. We have Thursday morning. Don't forget this is only for ladies, a luncheon it looks like here. And uh, if you're planning on attending that, it's going to be at the Madeira Sunrise Restaurant. You can let Karen Walsh know. That's me. That's, that's right, <laughs> Pastor's wife. And then, as you know, at our church, we open up our homes on Friday night. So invite your friends, your neighbors, even some of your family if you feel like having them over it. And just get together and fellowship and, and just talk about the Lord. You know, the Bible tells us that iron sharpeneth iron. Amen. We need that fellowship to grow and to mature in the Lord. And it's a great time to praise and to give glory. You know, I want to mention one thing this morning. Uh, uh, I might have worked. But uh, our sister back here, her, her fiancé David accepted the Lord Jesus Christ yesterday. And Mike, yes, Mike, I'm sorry. Bad one names. Wouldn't think of having seven kids. I can remember everybody's name, but I, I can't. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm named out, I guess. That part of my brain is full. But we want to praise God for that. That's so awesome to hear about the Lord coming in and receiving your husband as, as his child, his son, and we just want to rejoice in that with you. That's just so awesome. I praise God for that. And no, that's our job, isn't it? Yeah. To get out, to tell people about Jesus, and to bring them to Jesus and thus bring the God well. All right, Sam. Well, you can read the rest of the announcements there at the bottom of the bulletin. And uh, Sam, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. He hideth my soul. Four in four ninety six. Four ninety six.
praise that we pray that the gifts that we give you will be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you, Gene. I would love to have somebody sing that song for me whenever I to check out and go to heaven. It couldn't be a better song. I, I think you have fellows helping me hand these out. If you didn't get one, I've got a few left. But did, you, did you get the little? Anybody need one? Did you get one? All right. You don't have to take notes. I made a note for you. Well, it's good to be with you. And uh, Pastor called me and said that he was uh, going to be gone for at least this Sunday, six or seven days. So anyway, they're out on the ocean somewhere. I've only been on one cruise. How many of y'all been on a cruise? Let me see. I know the young lady in the back is taking a video of that. There. She's with our ministry, Let's Go Ministry. She loves to go on cruises. Been trying to talk me into going on a cruise. I went on one cruise in my life on the East Coast, the Bahamas or somewhere else. And was glad to get my feet back on the ground. <laughs> and I do remember, I, uh, this is true, I'm not making this up, but the night before, it was a long time ago, the night before we went on a cruise, I watched a movie called Titanic. <laughs> I'm really hesitant to step on that thing. <laughs> about a guy who was arguing with somebody uh, how the Titanic sank. And he blamed it on the Jews. They get blamed for everything, don't they? Yeah, he said the Jews did it. He said, how do you figure? He says, well, Greenberg, Goldberg, Iceberg, they're all one and the same. <laughs> so I don't get any better than that. <laughs> But that's the one cruise I've been on. I know I should go into some more, but uh, they are great, I'm sure. Pray for our, pray for our, your, your, your group that's on the cruise. Uh, Pete's been on a lot of cruises. Pete's probably the captain of the ship. He's been on the cruise. And uh, Pastor, he's done, he likes to go too. Does he come back a little heavier when he goes on a cruise? Does he come a little heavier back home? I mean, I heard yes. yes, the food is great on this cruise, isn't it? Food is great. Yeah. But it's good to be with you, and uh, we got up early this morning, as I said, to the Bible study class, and uh, just got in uh, under the line in time for the Bible study class. And uh, we had a good time talking about discoveries that we need to make. And these are built around really the kind of the Christmas theme, the one tonight. It's going to be more toward New Year's. On the back of the sheet that I gave you is kind of the outline of the message this evening. I hope you'll come back. We're going to talk about what kind of people is God looking for? Who does God want to use? And behind that question is this question. Will he use you in 2023? Do you want to be used by God? Into the, the, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro looking for somebody that he can use. Did God pick Mary just arbitrarily because she had blue eyes and blonde hair? That's not very likely. Is it? But, but why did God choose Mary? We're going to answer that question tonight. And I hope you'll come back you will come to a conclusion that God can use you. You know, there's lots of people that don't think God can use them. Did you know that? God can't use me. Well, God can <coughs> use you. And God wants to use you, you say. And he has a plan for your life. In fact, a great plan. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it is, about verse 15, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which has been foreordained before the foundation of the world. When God made you, and God doesn't make no junk, right? God doesn't make no junk. God can use you where you're at, who you are, regardless. I'm trophy number one. If God can use anybody, somebody said he can hit a straight leg with a crooked stick, and that's what he's done. <laughs> and while I look back over it, and I think, my soul, my soul, that God has used me. 
You know there's a song, and I sang it all the way from the ranch coming here this morning. I never got tired of singing it. But the title of the song is, Who Am I? Have anybody ever heard that song? Uh -huh. Who am I? Amen. When I think of how God left his home in glory, and came to dwell here on earth among the lowly such as I. He took my pain, he took my shame, and to Mount Calvary, he took my place. And I asked myself this question, who am I? And the chorus says, who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will, thine for? The answer I may never know why he would ever love me so that to an old rugged cross he go. For who am I? Amen. <laughs> who am I? I mean, in November of last year, those who study populations said the world population in November, I don't know if they picked the day, but in November, we reached eight billion people on the face of the earth. Sometimes you feel like you just don't know what else. But the Bible says, I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, about verse 26 and following, look among yourselves the kind of people that God chooses. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many powerful, but the weak. He chooses the most unexpected people. He, why? So that he gets all the glory for it. I mean, I can't stand up here and say, God chose me because I'm, I'm special, you know, I've I got such high IQ. <laughs> Spend a little time with me, you know, that's a lie. <laughs> God chooses people just like us, all of us, so that he gets the credit and the glory for it. That's the why. But we'll talk more about that tonight. Come back and be with us. Why did God choose Mary? What kind of person does God choose? And if you can make that discovery, you're going to come to the end of 2023 and say, I learned the first of this year what I need to be like for God to use me. What attributes need to be in my life for God to use me. And I, and God used me this year. And I'll tell you, if you can come to the end of this year and be able to say, God, use you, that'll melt your butter, that'll start your fire, that'll crack your cracker, that'll whatever it takes to get you excited. There's nothing more exciting than that. And this, you were telling me this morning, brother, that somebody, Mike, was that his name, got saved yesterday. Now, one of you were a star. I don't know who it was, but you, you, you led it to Jesus just like a star led the wife, well, led the wife, right? And God wants you to be a star this year. She wants you to shine. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said, oh, elsewhere, you're the light of the world. You don't use two different words for that. Uh, the word for I am the light of the world is original light. It's like the sun, that's original light. But when he said, you're the light of the world, the word there that's used for light is reflective light, lunar light. You and I don't have any light other than what's reflected. You know, when the, when, when the moon shines at night, did you know, give me know this. When the moon shines, and it was big last night. And when the moon shines at night, you know what that tells you? The sun is still shining on the other side. We always know the sun is shining and the moon is shining. And people will know the Lord is real if your life is reflecting his light. Amen? If you're shining for him. That's what we talked about in our Bible study, the wise man and the star. Lessons from the wise man lessons from the star. You can be his star. Well, this morning in this service, and I said in the earlier service, I really don't know the difference between teaching and preaching. But, uh, Pastor Rick said, now, the early services, Bible study, you're supposed to teach. I said, okay. And the evening services, Bible study, you're supposed to teach. Okay, okay. But at 11 o'clock, you can let her rip. You can preach. <laughs> I'm not sure. Know the difference. <laughs> so anyway, y'all listen up. And you got a little outline there that says, What the Shepherds Discovered. And we're going to talk about three things and ask the question. Do we have any shepherds here this morning? 
They discovered good news. What the shepherds discovered. Um, let's read about it in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. I want to read the story and then we'll take it on. Luke's Gospel, excuse me, it's chapter 2, isn't it? Uh, verse 8, we'll start with verse 8. <coughs> Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. I said earlier in the early service, of course the wise men were stargazers and probably astronomers, we don't know where they came from, but the shepherds were stargazers. I mean, they spent their nights by the campfire, right? What did they do? Open up their laptop? Pull up their smartphones? They didn't have anything to do with studying the heavens. And that was very common back in those days. Studying the heavens. They could, they could identify certain stars and different decons and galaxies, and, and, and not galaxies, but uh, constellations that were up in the heavens that were in the Hebrew zodiac. The Hebrews had a zodiac. And if you were to study their zodiac back then, starting perhaps with uh, Virgo, the Virgin, went all the way around to the cross and the wheel, it was the whole gospel presented in the heavens. There's books written about the gospel of the stars. You can get them. Before Moses penned the first book in the Bible, God never left anybody without a witness. The world was full of star Jesus back in those days. People today don't spend much time out of time, do they? When's the last time you sat before a campfire and looked up at the heavens and identified some of the stars that were out there? I'm telling you, our kids, we have young people that come out to our ranch, our camp, it's called Rock Creek Ranch, and we've got another youth group coming in March, I think it is. But some of those kids, especially from Tucson, they didn't even know, I don't think they know anything about the outdoors. They never spend any time outdoors. And they get out there, camp our service, and look up into the heavens. And the Bible says the heavens declare what? The glory of God. There is no language where their voice is not here, heard. Wow. It's all in there. But we have a more sure record, and that's the Bible. Amen? That gives us more detail. And that's more complete. So this story around Christmas time. Forgive me if you've already caught the Christmas spirit and don't need it to catch it again. We're looking at some Christmas texts that uh, go along with these three messages that I'm going to be sharing with you. And, and this service is, we looked at what the wise men discovered. Don't even remember what we said. What did the wise men discover? Great. <laughs> they discovered that sin was rampant, the scriptures were reliable, uh, the Savior was real, I use alliteration a lot. And the last point was the search was removed. The search was that's close. Yeah. If you didn't get the copy from their earlier service, come see me after a copy of your But discovery. The Holy Spirit is at work in your life as a Christian to help you discover the hidden secrets that are in the scripture. And the Bible says God's word is like gold, much fine gold. And the Bible says as a, as a student of Scripture, you know, it's not the gold in the Scripture is not always laying on the surface. Some of the great truths in the Bible, you've got to dig for them. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And there's some discoveries that I know I haven't made yet in my Bible study. I'm looking forward to it. But these discoveries I've made, and I want to pass them on to you. And, 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 and there's three in this passage we're going to read. The shepherds. Isn't it interesting that the first people God shared the birth of Jesus with were shepherds? Now, he shared Martha, I mean, to Mary and uh, to Joseph, his conception, but not his birth. They, they already knew that, of course, when Jesus was born. God had already spoken to the angel mm -hmm. Gabriel. But the first people that got the message from God were common every day. No name. Insignificant. 
People like you shepherds. If you couldn't get any other job when Jesus was born in that day, somebody could always needed a shepherd for sheep. But it just, it just took average kind of people. But maybe sometimes you feel like that. I'm not special. I don't, you know, I'm not a star. I, 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 I don't have a great education or whatever. You know, we tend to put ourselves down. But, you know, look out among yourselves the kind of people God chooses so he can make a for us. And God went to these shepherds. Now, the wise men saw guidance with a star. The shepherds saw glory in the sky. Isn't that right? How would you define that word glory, folks? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, no. Uh, for all of sin come short of the what? Yeah. I've always been short, so I've always cut that verse in half and said, all of sin and come short. But all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The worst part of dying without Jesus is not fire and brimstone and hell, and though I believe that's in the Bible, but the worst thing about being lost and stepping out into eternity is to miss the glory. And miss it. Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, Father, I pray that someday you'll show the glory that I had with you before the world was ever even created to these my disciples and to all those who believe after, after them. Wow. What do we have to look forward to? Just the glory. Just the glory of God. And so the shepherds saw glory in the sky. Let's read about it. Let's read about it. Verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about angels, but uh, how many of y'all believe in that? How many of you have ever seen an angel? Well, the Bible says sometimes we entertain angels. Oh, wait a minute, did you know that? You've probably seen angels, didn't even know you were talking to them. Really? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, when God created angels, they are innumerable. Now, he named the stars and numbered the stars, it says. But there are so many angels out there, the number of angels can't be numbered, it says. They hold a lot of them. Good news is they're ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. Wow. So they're, they're angels. And sometimes, in fact, when I get to the end of this message, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when you've met an angel who didn't even know it. But uh, let's finish reading our text. And the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. It's called good news. Right? Little boy was in a Christmas pageant. He didn't want to be in it, but they forced him in it. Didn't have enough kids. He was shy. He was afraid to get it wrong. No one had two words to say. No, maybe four words. All he had to say in the, in the, in the, in the pageant for the church. I bring you good tidings of great joy. That's all you got to say. No, you can do this. We don't have anybody else. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Memorize that. But he was terrified. Didn't he? Got up and saw all those people. And he just froze. I was waiting for him to give his little announcement. Couldn't say it. To find him, he just burst out and said, Man, have I got news for you. <laughs> Man, have I got news for you. Wouldn't you say we live in a bad news world? You know, this church, any church preaching the gospel, we've got good news for a bad news world. It's good news. And so the angel came and said, have I got news for you? Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings, good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. All people. And the shepherds discover it in our story. Oh, we still haven't finished reading it. See how I, I, I chase rabbits and i got to get into the, stay with the book, okay? All right. But where were we? Uh, which shall be to all people. 
Verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with this angel a multitude of <coughs> heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, Let's go down to Bethlehem and see this thing, which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all of these things in her heart and pondered on them. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and that had been told unto them. I think some people today, as I've already mentioned, can identify with these shepherds. Their job is sort of thankless. You know, I'm sure they felt like, and maybe you do too, when I die, I'm not going to leave any trail behind me or imprints in the world that I lived in, and my life's been rather insignificant and unimportant. I'm just as common as they come, and nobody will remember me when I die. I think sometimes that's bothersome to us, isn't it? Even the thief on the cross said, well, you remember me. He'd been a rascal all his life. Well, I want to be remembered. But many times we don't feel like we are of any importance at all. Good news. Good news. The first person. You know, he could, he could have sent the angel to the palace in Jerusalem. To the throne room of King Herod. To the religious leaders, Caiaphas and Anaphas, the Sanhedrin and the high priests. He could have sent it to the wealthy and and the well-educated people. Good. But he didn't. He sent it to some shepherds. The good news. Just common folks. They're the, they're the kind of folks that say, Who am I <laughs> that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray not my will, mine for? The answer I may never know. Why he should love me so. And to an old rugged cross he built. You ever feel like that? Well, you are somebody because God made you somebody. At the time of Jesus' birth, I said in the earlier Bible study class that there, in November it was shared that they are, there are about 8 billion people now walking on the face of the earth. Now at the time of Jesus' birth, they said, there were between... 150 and 200 million people. Now that sounds like a whole lot. But I mean, we got more people in America. 360 million, something like that. 360 million. Go to China, they've got 1 million, 360 million. They got a problem there. But that even if it was just 150 million at the time of Jesus' birth, a lot of people. But who did he go to to announce the birth? to these shepherds in the hills. These stargazers looking into the heavens. These men who would have said, I'm a nobody. But everybody is somebody in God's eyes. Did you know that? Amen. If he knows the stars by name, don't you think he knows your name? You're important to him. He has a plan for your life. Isaiah 29, 19, I'm not sure that's correct. I know the thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts of meaning and purpose and joy and blessing and an expected end. God says, I have thoughts for you. David said, what is man that you're mindful? Your mind is full of every man. He, he, he thinks of us, it says in David's Psalms 69. My memory's not as good as it used to be. But he said in his confessionary song, Psalm, how precious are your thoughts for me, dear God. 
a number as the sands of the sea. <laughs> You're always on his mind. He's mindful. I don't know how often you think of him, but you, he, he thinks of you all the time, folks. Is that good or bad? David said on one occasion after he said, I can't go anywhere to get away from him. <laughs> if I catch the, the clouds of the morning and drift out over the Mediterranean, he's there. Day or night, he sees me. He always, he always knows me. He's got his eye on us. You're important to him. And so he came, he came to these shepherds and they learned these three wonderful, wonderful truths. The first one we've already alluded to. God's good news is personal. God's good news is personal. He came personally, sent an angel to these shepherds with the good news. And you don't slide into heaven on mom and daddy's coattail, do you? It's a personal thing, a personal relationship. God wants to speak to you personally. You open your Bible, he speaks to you personally. <laughs> He knows you by name. You're important to him. He created you and made you. And he has a plan for your life. A purpose for your life. That's personal, folks. VIPs are very important people. But the reason they're VIPs is because they have a very important purpose. And God has a purpose for your life. Even in our old age, he still wants to use it. He has a reason for us being here. I told you before, I remember years ago, if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. Go ahead, check it. Check it real quick. You got a pulse? Come on, you're God's little darlings. Why hasn't he taken you to heaven yet? How many of you think heaven's going to be better in this world? Let me see your hands. All right. If heaven's going to be so much better than this world, why hasn't the God who loves you and made you taken you to heaven yet? Because he has a purpose for you. You're here for a reason. And so these angels made the, or these shepherds made this very, very important discovery. God could have gone to monarchs and generals and rich and religious, but he came to them, sent those angels. And suddenly there was with that one angel a multitude. Saying, glory to God in the heights. I can only imagine how stunned they must have been. But I also think, wow. I don't know if they came to anybody else. They came to me. And God wants to do a personal work in your life. You to to uh, I heard about a preacher back east. His name's Tony Campolo. And, and uh, every year, around Christmas time, he has a party for all the prostitutes that live in the area of his church. Well, the prostitutes, you've been doing it for years. And he invites them all to come to the party. And they have a big dinner. And they provide some things, gifts for those prostitutes. Why? Because even you are important to God. He loves you. And he knows you. Remember when old Zacchaeus was up in the tree? Mm -hmm. I preached a sermon one time to a bunch of kids at the chapel at school in Sacramento. And the pastor said, I want you to preach to our kids at chapel today. They go to school. I said, okay, I'll do that. Now, that was a long time ago. I hadn't been a Christian very long. I hadn't been preaching very long. And so I said, I'm going to preach on the guy up in the sycamore tree. And I preached the whole sermon on Nicodemus in the sycamore tree. <laughs> It wasn't Nicodemus, you remember? Was that Jesus? Oh, man, I waxed eloquently with Nicodemus in the sycamore tree. <laughs> Until those kids corrected me at the end of their chapel. Humiliated. But you know the story of Zacchaeus. Nobody liked him. He had no friends. He was cheating the people on their taxes. He was serving the enemy to Israel, the Romans. I mean, he didn't have anybody. I short on top of everything else. And he heard Jesus was coming to Jer Jer Jericho, climbed up in the sycamore tree. And what happened? Jesus looked at him. And Zach said, ah, he sees me. He sees me. 
And then Jesus said, Zacchaeus, he knows me. He doesn't just see me, he knows me. And Jesus said, come down. Huh? He sees me, he knows me, he needs me. I'm going to your house. Isn't that a neat story? Most act up in the city. That's one of my favorite stories of the year. But I'm telling you, he sees you, he knows you, he needs you, he wants you. I always wondered what Zach did after that. He quit <laughs> being a tax collector. He said, I'm going to pay back everybody I cheated for. Remember that? Changed his life. Well, good news is to be personal. There was a lady named uh, Mary Rowe that lived real close to our church that I pastored for so long in Tucson on Speedway. And uh, we were, every every fifth Sunday of the, of the month, we would have a call, Bread of Life Sunday. And we hand out Bibles in our neighbors' house on the doors. We had children that would have Bibles. And uh, we just give away Bibles. And I came to this lady's house. She lived in an alleyway in a little old house. And I knocked on the door. Nobody had my Nobody answered the door, so I was walking away, and I saw, going down the alley, uh, there was a lady that was hollering through this window. I didn't know it then, she was in the bathroom. She was saying, who's out there? Who, who, who wants to see me? <laughs> in fact, I think she was sitting on the throne. And I said, well, I'm just Pastor Hart, and we're handing out Bibles, and we're just visiting people. She said, hold on, I'll be out the door in just a minute. She came out the door. Old, old lady, I baptized her when she was 83 or 84 hours. But uh, she said, come in, come in. She was so lonely. What are you doing? Why'd you come by that door? She says, let me hug you. Kiss me, kiss me. Well, she kissed me. And I don't know how long after that, every time I see her at church, she had real slobbery kisses. <laughs> Everybody in church knew that you'd get wet if she kissed you. <laughs> yeah, she was a sweetheart. She got that done. But she was so lonely all those years. Didn't know anybody cared, let alone that God cared for her. These shepherds discovered that everyone, and the good news for everyone, is personal. It's for you. God knows you personally. You're important to him. What an amazing thing to be a shepherd out there, tending sheep, and all of a sudden, the heavens explode with the music. That'd build up your ego a little bit, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that help your self-esteem just a little bit? You're not a nobody, you're somebody. And that's the way God sees you. Here's the second thing I want you to see that they discovered. God's good news is not only personal, but it is precise. When God speaks to us, he doesn't beat around the bush. His rules, his orders, his guidance is not nebulous or vague. God is precise. And he said, fellas, for a minute, forget the sheep. Get to Bethlehem. You're going to find a baby in Bethlehem in a manger who is the Savior of the world. Go! And they obeyed him precisely. You know, when God speaks to us, it's not up for hope. It's not up for discussion. Be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. God has this message for us, and it's to be obeyed precisely. Now today, for instance, you don't go to the manger to see the Savior. You go to the cross, right? That's the way. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way than this. And if I lose sight of the, of the cross, the way of uh, the gates of life are. There's that precise. If you want to go to heaven, folks, you got to go to the cross. That on a hill far away, that old rugged cross, you got to go to Calvary. That's where you get saved. At the cross. There's no other way than this. Precise. A lot of people today want to go to heaven, but they don't know anything about the cross, substitutionary death of Jesus. They want to earn their way to heaven. I'll tell you later in this message. Repeat it again, but the manger is empty today. The cross is empty today. 
The crypt, the grave, is empty today. Amen. There's only one thing that's not empty, and that's the crown. When you were born, God put a cross and a crown in your heart, figuratively speaking. And everybody's got to decide whether to give him the cross or the crown. Crown him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Put it on his head, not yours. So, what did these shepherds discover? They discovered that God's good news was personal. And they discovered that it was precise. Look at verse 20. We've already read it, but chapter 2 and verse 20, I believe it is. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. <coughs> I don't know whether I can assume that every one of you is good church, great church. I love coming here. You're saved, but if you're saved, have you been baptized? So I haven't done that yet. I don't you know, that's practically speaking, I don't think I need to do that. Well, you do too. Precisely speaking, you need to do that. It doesn't save you, but it's a command. Jesus said in John 13, 13, you call me Lord, and so you should, because Lord is who I am. <coughs> And if you haven't been baptized, you ought to see Pastor Rick this week and get it done. And obey God precisely. If he asks you to give 10%, don't try to get by with two. <laughs> obey. If he's, you know, there's some things you just don't need to pray about. You don't have to pray about, should I read my Bible this week? We're told to read it. Should I spend some time in prayer this week? We're, to say, we're, we're told to pray without ceasing. Yes. You don't have to pray to find out what God wants you to do about praying or tithing or giving or going. Isn't the, those things aren't optional. Here. Obey God with precision. precision. Suppose when God came to Abraham and said, Hey, I want you to take your son Isaac. Go to a mountain, I'll show you. And offer him there as a sacrifice. Now, Abe could have gone to any mountain. But God showed him the mountain, didn't he? Now, Moriah. Same hill Jesus was crucified on 2,000 years later. Isn't that coincidence? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. <laughs> but suppose he had climbed up some other mountainside to offer his son. Well, he'd have missed it. So would poor old Isaac. He'd have missed it too because the lamb went up that mountain. You pick another mountain, there'll be no lamb to show up to take Isaac's place. We obey God with precision, folks. Obedience, so important. And they did it just as it was told unto them. Now, they could have gone to Jerusalem, but the angel said, you need to go to Bethlehem. Well, well what about the temple? Said, no, forget the temple. You need to go to Bethlehem. And so they went to Bethlehem. And found the stable. Maybe one of the shepherds said, I know where the stable is. I've been there. And they found the angel. And they found the baby in the manger. Just as God said, because they were precise in their obedience. Now that's just a nugget of truth that's in the scriptures that the shepherds are sharing with us. Good news is personal. Good news is to be obeyed with precision. Don't argue with God. Third thing. Good news is not only personal and it's not only to be obeyed precisely, but good news is for proclamation. Look at verse 17 again with me. It says in verse 17, Now when they had seen him, Jesus said the man, they made widely known the saying which was told them according to this child. The good news, now listen to me. I have been shepherding Baptist churches for 60 years. And I know, I read the other day, only about 5% of all Baptists have ever personally led anybody to Jesus. There's something bad and wrong with that statistic. Good news is to be shared and proclaimed. That's what we learned from this text. These three things, hidden truths if you want to. They must be hidden because 
lot of people act like they've never heard it. It's personal. Whoever you are, God can use you. You're important to Him. He knows you by your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. That's getting harder for me. Right? Mine all the time. But He knows you in detail. And good news is to be obeyed. And good news is to be proclaimed and shared. What would you think of somebody who discovered the cure for all cancer, but he decided not to tell the world? Hmm? That'd be pretty cruel, wouldn't it? But you've got something better than the cure for cancer. You've got the cure for death. Eternal life. How can you beat that? Forgiveness of sins. Joy of the Lord. On, 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 on. Peace which passes understanding. You've got all that wrapped up in Jesus. That's the Christmas gift that we're to share. And it's to be proclaimed. I said this morning, I'll sing it, I'll shout it wherever I go. I want all to hear it. I want all to know the joy of salvation that makes my heart glow since I have been born again. <laughs> Perhaps the primary evidence of the fact or truth that you have been born again, the primary evidence is that you desire to share it. Good news is for proclamation. People are precious. Proclaiming the good news precisely is about what God wants us to do. Are you a listening shepherd? Here's a poem. Let me read it to you. Ruth Glover wrote it. Say, tell me, in the long and lonely watches of your night, have your heavens, has, has your heavens ever opened? Have, you, have they filled with radiant light? Have you caught the swift and silent sound of angels on the wing? Have you glimpsed the beauty, the heavenly host? Have you heard them sing? Did you hear this message? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. And did you hasten to the manger side at Bethlehem? Did you return with wonder, glorifying, praising God? Then tell me, shepherd. Tell me. Have you spread this news abroad? Good news is personal. I believe that you were the only lost person on earth. Not eight billion. If you were the only one treading, leaving prints on earth, God would have sent his son for you. And Jesus would have come because you're important to him. I think the cross tells me, Jesus is saying, I would rather go to this cross than spend eternity without you. Wow. That's how important you are to him. It's personal. We're to obey it with precision. Invite him into our hearts. He that has the Son, which as many as received him, and then gave the power. You know, Christianity is not just believing something. You want to be precise. It's not just believing something. Christianity is receiving someone. And you invite Jesus into your heart. You say, well, I believe the Bible. I believe that, but I've never invited him. But, I, you know, I don't know what that means. But I, just, I believe the Bible, and I believe Jesus was God's Son, and, and that he died on the cross for my sins, and that he was born of a virgin. Have you ever invited me? No, I've never done that. I know that. It is important. John said, first epistle, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son, and he that has the son has the life, and he that has not the son of God hath not life. Let's uh, bow our heads together. Did you do that with right now? Father in heaven, you know my heart. You know the words of my mouth as well as the meditations of my heart. And Father, you know that there's an emptiness in my heart. Just like the manger is empty today, we don't need to go there. The cross is even empty today. Jesus came down from that cross. And the crypt is empty, the grave is empty. He rose again, he lives. And because of that, he can have a personal relationship. And we can have a personal, because he lives. And 
We need to live our life precisely as he guides us and leads us. Our hearts are empty if we've never invited Jesus there. If you've never done it right now while you're sitting there and our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, the Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you can be saved. If you believe that faith which we preached unto you, which is in your mouth, Paul said, and I preach it. That's how close Jesus is right now. He's right there on your lips. And if you'll just confess him as Lord, invite him into your heart and into your life. <coughs> Personally. Precisely. And then begin to share it with friends and neighbors. You'll discover what life is all about and how you can live an important, victorious, purposeful, meaningful life that will last for eternity. So if you ask him into your heart right now, you're the only one that can do that. Trust him as you say. Tell somebody, as soon as you step out of this church, I made that decision this morning. I did precisely what God said. I came to the cross. Not the manger, but the cross. <clears throat> and trusted him as my substitute and my savior. That in, Father, we pray for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sam, are we, we'll, we'll come to Christ and trust Him as your Savior. Reach your name in your life. Join the church. Come right now.